This is the Ted Wallachian Podcast. Brought to you by Tom's Place. For the finest in men's clothing at unbeatable prices, it's Tom's Place at 190 Baldwin in the heart of Kensington Market. Tom's Place will suit you. And Helenda's The Meat People. Enjoy their award-winning products at selected Metro, Sobeys, Fortino's, and Foodland locations. Helenda's The Way Sausage Should Taste. And now, here's Ted. Well, thanks very much once again for joining us and welcome to the podcast. We appreciate you taking the time to spend with us if it's your first time. Welcome. Hope you enjoyed. And uh, if you're uh, somewhat of a regular, we, we appreciate regularity, as I'm sure you do as well. And don't forget to pass along uh, the information to your friends and have them um, sign up with us. doesn't cost anything. Just not, You don't even have to really make a commitment, per se. Just, you know, but you want to, I hope. Anyway, you're going to like this show. If you're a fan of The Tonight Show especially, my special guest today is a television writer and producer named Daryl Vickers. Now, that might not mean anything to you, but listen to this. From 1986 to 1992, he and his partner, Andrew Nichols, were first writers, then head writers for the iconic Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson. They were, in fact, the only Canadians ever to write for that show. Daryl Vickers joins me now. Before we get into the Tonight Show, can we just go back a little bit here? I want to talk about your relationship with with your partner for for so many, so many years, Andrew Nichols. I found it fascinating that you were both born in England, different parts of England. You're born four days apart? Uh, Three days apart. Three days apart. Both your families emigrate to Canada at one point. In, in the both, middle 60s, because you could do it in those days because you didn't need any visas or anything. If you were a member of the Commonwealth, you right? could just pack up and leave and, and arrive in Canada. So, yeah. So my father took advantage of that. So where did you arrive when, when you came to Canada first? Uh, Toronto. I mm-hmm. remember uh, coming over. It was like, I don't know, let's say it was July. I think it was probably June or something. And it was 90 degrees out. And we were driving back from the airport to, I think we were at Eglinton and Lawrence, if that's an air, somewhere around there. And I remember driving back and thinking, wow, this place is a tropical paradise. It's so hot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> indeed. And and so, Andrew, did, did he also come to Toronto? Because you, um, you met in, in, you went to school together in Oshawa, right? Yeah, I think he was in Oshawa most of the time. He was, I'm trying to think, he was here a little earlier than me, I believe, like maybe a year earlier. And we met in grade seven. So I was here for grade three. So, yeah, I was here a few years before we ran into each other. Right. So you strike up this this friendship and this, uh, you have this passion, both of you, for music and for we were we were songwriters initially, uh, you know, much yeah. like um, uh, Rogers and Clark in Ishtar. We would sit there writing the world's <laughs> worst songs in his basement. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we wanted to be the next Lennon and McCartney. And, uh, you know, I, for some uh, somewhere along the way, we got into comedy. And as as things progressed back in those days, being a musician was un- unbelievably expensive, Recording equipment was expensive, you yeah. know, amps and everything were expensive, and he had a typewriter, so that we we could write comedy for free. But it was <laughs> it was enormously expensive to do music, so we kind of drifted into the cheaper of the two alternatives. But you, but you did form a band called uh, Nobby Clegg and the Civilians. I, I have no idea how you came up with that name, but that's cool. You had a, you had a couple of sing- singles, and you received some airtime at a radio station, an alternate radio station here uh, in Toronto, CFNY, uh, which I actually worked at for, for a period of time over, over the years. But I guess at, at one point you figured not only is it less expensive to be writers, there's a better career opportunity for you. Is that what propelled you to move in that direction? I, I think we, we were more talented as, as writers uh, than performers. I don't, you know, we weren't very good. Uh, Andrew could really play well. I don't sing well. And I was the singer <laughs> of the band. And I think personality-wise, we're uh, probably better off uh, alone in a room than trying to uh, entertain people. So, yeah, yeah why not give 
the material we write to people who actually can entertain, and it was it was a better system for us. So you 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 if you want to become a writer on the Tonight Show, it's not a matter of just picking up the phone and calling and say, "Johnny, it's Daryl. I got some funny stuff for you." No, uh, you know he 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 had his favorites, but there was a there was there was a lot of turnover on the show before Andrew and I uh, actually joined. And uh, they had let two writers go who'd been there, I think, about 18 months. And they were Al Jean and Mike Reese, who went on to uh, work on The Simpsons for, what, 50 years now. And Al Jean is still there. And Mike does uh, punch up on the show. But uh, Mm -hmm. our manager had found out through a, a friend of his on the show who was working with the band that they had let these guys go. And uh, through his contact, he was able to get our material to to uh, Carson's head writer, who was Ray Siller. And basically what you were uh, required to do was some of Johnny's spots. So it would be an Aunt Blabby, Zontar, uh, you know, uh, Floyd uh, Turbo. Yes. Uh, yeah, he thought Carnax were, you know, that would be the natural thing for a comedy writer to attempt. But Johnny thought they were easy. So the word was, don't write Carnax. So we sent the material in about six weeks later. We got a call on like a Thursday and to, that we were going to go in on Monday to meet Johnny. And uh, so we said, oh, great. And then on, on Friday, Joan Rivers decides to bolt the show and make the announcement that she's doing her own show in competition with Johnny. So I thought, Oh God, this is, yeah. this is probably not the best time to be on this show. And we'd written for Joan as well. So you go in and, uh, Fred, the court of it was, you know, he was the executive producer for the show. You met him first. It was, there was a whole, uh, pageantry to, to being hired on this show. So you go mm-hmm. in and he was living in this, uh, he was in this, trailer this this basically uh, one of those high school portable units they used to have yeah and a lot of the staff was in there fred was in there and a couple of the writers and you'd go into his office and he would give you the spiel now gentlemen when you go in to see mr carson uh, please keep it brief don't bore the shit out of him and he would give you this <laughs> little spiel and oh yeah fred was very very funny uh, in a in a very uh-huh. cruel cruel way but he was funny yeah okay. and then he would lead you out and you go into the main studio, which was this gigantic complex, and you would get into a golf cart, his private golf cart, and he would drive you in his golf cart through the through the NBC uh, studio complex uh, to, to the op- opposite side. And you would walk up these long, thin stairs and above his own uh, studio where he shot, he had this tiny little cramped office. And we went in there and he talked about there was supposedly going to be a tsunami because there'd been an earthquake somewhere. And the tsunami was about an inch and a half tall. So we joked about yeah. that and, you know, a couple of things. And, you know, we tried to be amusing to a point. But, you know, and he said, don't allow, don't be afraid to be wild, guys, if you get the job. So basically it was like a 20 minutes we were in there and we went home. And I thought, gee, and Fred, as we came out, he says, well, gentlemen, uh, I'll be giving you a call unless we can find somebody a lot better than you to work on the show. <laughs> <laughs> so we went home and I thought, you know, I can't imagine me working on The Tonight Show. So I thought I was never going to get the gig. And two days later, we got the call and uh, we were hired. So now primarily, they wanted you to write sketches for the different characters. They didn't want you to touch Karnak. What about the opening? Oh, no, monologue? we did write Karnak. We did the sketches. We didn't write the monologue at the time. They, the show was divided into two groups. There was the people who wrote the sketches, and then there were the monologue writers. And the monologue writers had it easy because they only worked when Johnny worked. The sketch writers had right. to write all the time because it was much harder to put the sketches together than it was the monologue material. And the monologue material had to be timely, where a sketch, you know, if you're doing Zontar or whatever, they, you know, they're not time contingent. Right. Which did you prefer? Uh, well, eventually we did both. Um, they were different disciplines. Uh, when, you know, we, we became head writers, it, it was, you know, it's, it was difficult doing both because basically we would show up at eight o'clock in the morning and we would write till 10 o'clock. You didn't want to do too many jokes because he got five or six things. We found out that two and a half pages of, of jokes was about it. 
If you gave him five pages, you basically got nothing in because his eyes would glaze over. It was just too many jokes to read. So there was a mm-hmm. perfect number. You know, I, I have no idea how many jokes would be on five pages, uh, three, three pages, but you didn't want to go over three pages. So that was until about 10. Johnny would call us at uh, about quarter after 10 and go over what the death spot was for that day. And Andrew always took that call because Johnny did not like to talk on the phone. He was very businesslike, and I, I just didn't think I could stand the pressure. So Andrew would pick up the phone and be, <laughs> okay, Johnny, we're going to do Karnak today. We're going to do Zontar. We're going to bring down the props at 2.30. We'll go over this and that, that. Okay, goodbye. And that was it. That was the entire conversation. <laughs> So there was wow. a lot of stress in those things. I only I only had to talk to him once because I think Andrew was having a tooth removed or something, and I had to do the the call with Johnny, and it was it, it was very stressful. Now, when you first signed on, you you didn't, you didn't sign on for for a year. You signed on for what thirteen weeks at a time. It was it was a year contract, but broken up. So there was options. So there was a a three month option, then another three months option, then a six month option, and right. with a raise each time. And uh, the first uh, option, they had to let you know four weeks in advance that they were letting you go. And Ray didn't like us. I have no idea what we, what the problem was, but uh, he fired us. So we got our notice that we were going to quit. And this, this is a lot of conversation here, but basically Fred and Peter did not like Ray Siller. At all. This is Peter LaSalle. Yeah, he was producer. the producer, and Fred was the executive producer. Ray was the head writer, who was the guy who f- hired and fired the writers. So there was always this animosity between the two camps. And basically, uh, one day we were writing for Gary Shandling because he was one of the guest hosts. And Peter came into to the, uh, Gary's dressing room and Gary said, you know, those guys are really good. Those guys are really funny. And Peter said, well, that's weird because uh, Ray says they're not contributing and we just fired them. And he said, and Gary said, I think you're making a mistake. So Fred and Peter come to us and they said, you know, all I, all I hear from Ray is you're not contributing. I said, well, you know, we'd, we'd written literally a thousand pages of, of death spot by then. So we gave him our best bits and we gave them to Fred and Fred gave them to Johnny. So it's literally our last day at work and we get a call from Fred. He wants us to come down to his office. So we go down to his office and and we sit there and he says, now, gentlemen, I'm going to ask you a question and I want you to tell me absolutely truthfully what the answer is. Did you give this material that I'm holding here in my hand to uh, to Ray Siller. And we said, yes. And he said, I'm going to ask you one more time just to make it absolutely <laughs> clear that you hand this material to Ray Siller. And he said, yes, we did. Go back to your offices, gentlemen, and perhaps there'll be a call. So I don't know. It was like four o'clock. Our, our day ended at 530 and our careers ended at 530. And Fred <laughs> called and said, you're not leaving. <laughs> so he hired us back. So we, we come back on the show, and uh, three months later, uh, we go past the four-week point where they have to let you know uh, that they're going to fire you. So right. I, phoned my, uh, I phoned Ted, who's our manager, and I said, oh, we're, we're past this point. Now, we get automatically picked up. Don't call it. Don't call and ask if we've been picked up. For some reason... Ted phones up and asks if we've been picked up and Ray fires us again. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been fired twice now. And so, so basically what happens was my wife looks at the contract and says, well, no, they've, they've waited too long. They have to give you four weeks notice and it's only two weeks. So we, we went to Fred or the union or who are, I can't remember at the moment. And they hired us back. But they, instead of our six weeks, which we would have been picked up for, we were only hired for uh, six months. We were only hired for three months. And at this point, what happened was they brought this other writer on uh, and uh, Patrick, and he was writing monologue and the death spots. Now, the difference between the two was the sketches and all that material went to Ray. The monologue material went directly to Johnny. So I phoned up Peter LaSalle and I said, we'd like to write monologue. 
because then we'd have material that Johnny would actually see every day and he'd see how funny we were. So that's what happened. We, we started sending monologue in to Johnny and uh, we, Ray never fired us again. And uh, when he got fired, uh, like a couple of years later, we took his job. So he was probably wise to fire us because we eventually uh, replaced him. Big difference between being a staff writer and being a head writer, I would imagine, other than the money. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's everybody's dream to, to write for the Tonight Show. When we were in Canada, yeah. writing in Oshawa was the dream. And then sure. you come down and you think, boy, you know, I'd love to be the head writer. We had been on the show for two and a half years, so we knew how the show worked. And we took over as head writers two weeks before Christmas. And then there was a three-week Christmas uh, break. And we did our two weeks uh, as head writers of the show. And I spent that three weeks dreading going back. The pressure was so hard because the difference between the two was when you're just a writer, you're sending the material to the head writer and he's putting everything together. When you're the head writer, you're deciding what is funny and what is not funny. And you are giving it to Johnny Carson and saying, Johnny, I believe this is the funniest stuff we have. And this, you should do this in front of America. And that difference is is, it was crushing. It took, I, I would say, till March before Andrew and I got our, our legs under us and we started to really feel the rhythm of the show. You know, it's like going from, you know, if you're, if you're doing very, very well at, uh, you know, AAA ball and then you go up to the major leagues, it's just a different thing. It, it's, yeah, sure. you know, it, it, it just was, it, it, was a, it was a real eye-opener because, you, you know, I, we, as I say, we were there for two and a half years. We thought we knew how it worked. And it, the difference was just night and day. Was there ever any concern or any discussion about the fact that, that you and Andrew were both Canadians? We were legal at the time. Uh, we had... No, I didn't mean... <laughs> no, no, I mean I legally mean, in the States. Yeah. yeah uh, no, 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 we were the, actually we were the only Canadians on the show. And we, every once in right. a while, we would do something where we would write a joke. And I would phone my wife. Uh, so we'd be late at night and, uh, we'd be writing something and, uh, we do the joke where Dr. Ballard's just, just hit the sweet spot for the, whatever the joke was. And I called <laughs> my wife and said, do you know what Dr. Ballard's dog food is? And she'd say, no. So there was full scap and Dr. Ballard's and, uh, there were some kind of cookies. I can't remember the cookies, but Christie's maybe there were all these Canadian yeah. things that wish we had to double check to make sure I was in, uh, I used to go and do the, um, the technical stuff uh, for about 12 o'clock, 12, 15, we used to go down to Fred's office and everybody, there would be a staff meeting and the guests would, uh, you know, the, the people in charge of the guests would talk about that. And I would talk about the props and everything. And we had this, we had this spot and I can't remember what the thing was, but we had a crown and anchor wheel. Remember those mm -hmm. things that you, yep. And they, they built this thing and nobody knew what it was. They built it because we told them to build it. But so I had to cut the spot even after we built this crown and anchor because they don't call it that in the States. I can't remember what it's called there, but it is. So they built a crown and anchor wheel and nobody knew what this thing was. Uh, what is that, guys? <laughs> so well, you, you yeah. do it and it lands on things. And no, nobody knew. Now, how often would, would you have seen Johnny Carson when you first began writing? We met him, as I and say, about uh, what, about two weeks before we started on the show. We, you know, mm -hmm. we went to his office for the job interview and we did not see him for or talk to him for another two and a half years. The next wow. time we talked to him, we got a call uh, to go down to to his office, which was a different office now. And uh, we went down to his office and we were waiting in the waiting room and he had fired Ray and he had fired Kevin Mahone. He had fired uh, a couple of the other writers. And he had fired uh, Shirley Wood, who was who had, was a talent book who had been there for a million years. Yeah. And Fred was coming out of the office after all these people had been fired. And we were sitting there waiting to be shot. And uh, Fred said, hello, gentlemen, it's nothing bad. <laughs> and, we, <laughs> we, and we went in and there was Johnny. And he said, I'm making some changes, boys. And, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're going to do some things now. And, uh, and we were the head writers. And that was the second time we ever talked to Johnny. He made us head writers. Now, did the head writers used to assemble at Johnny's place in Malibu on a weekly or monthly basis? That was actually our suggestion. 
uh, when we went down, because I, you know, as I say, we, we didn't see or talk to Johnny for two and a half years. And there mm-hmm. was this kind of separation and you never knew what Ray was talking to him about. John, uh, Ray was the only person who talked to Johnny. So uh, Andrew suggested that we get together at the beginning of the week, go over what he wanted to do, get his feedback, feel, you know, what he was feeling to do. And we would pitch him material. And so yeah, he liked the idea. So we would, dr- we, and it was a long thing. We had to drive to Malibu every Monday morning. And we, he had, he had his gigantic house. And then across the street, there was a crescent. And in the middle of the crescent with, with these gigantic walls, he had his tennis complex and a big uh, tennis pavilion overlooking his court. And we would go there uh, every Monday. And uh, Rolf, the, uh, his butler, would serve us orange juice. And we would sit around mm-hmm. this big coral table uh, overlooking his tennis court. And we would pitch him ideas. Well, you know, maybe we should. We haven't done Karnak in a while. Let's do expressions nobody here. Uh, you know, let's do Turbo because so-and-so is in the news at the moment. And when we ran short of... Uh, uh, stuff to pitch him, we would ask him about Bob Hope, and then he would talk for another hour, and then we'd go back and write our stuff. Now, he didn't like Bob Hope, did he? You know, I think he was frustrated. The The thing was that by the time we were on the show, Bob was well into his 80s, couldn't hear, uh, couldn't see very well, and he had to be on the show four times a year because he had a deal with NBC to do four specials. So they right. would always, so Bob would always come on the show to do uh, pieces, uh, you know, do a little uh, press for for the for his special, and then afterwards, uh, he would use our audience to do the monologue. So basically, everybody would ask to stay after the show, and he would come out and do ninety minutes of jokes straight, and we would they would film them, and he would cut that down to to five minutes uh, for the show. But when he was on the show, because he couldn't hear, you had to do the questions in order. You could not change anything because he would answer the question he had memorized if you asked him a different question. And, you know, he just wasn't there. Most, you know, he just... So Johnny was very frustrated with that because, you know, he liked to have a little spontaneity and, he, you know, if something came up, he liked to go with whatever was... You couldn't do that with Bob because he couldn't hear what was going on. Conversely, he loved Jack Benny. Jack Benny was like a hero, an idol to him. Oh no, he loved Jack. He, um, uh, yeah. I mean, obviously, uh, Mr. Benny was long past by the time we were on the show. But he would often talk about uh, Jack Benny. He would just. Uh, he said one of the things uh, that he, you know, Jack was an enthusiast about things. You know, everything. You know, if he liked something, it was the greatest. So he said. One day, this was way back in New York in the 60s, he had Jack on the show and, you know, they were, he was a huge fan. So he invited Jack to his apartment in in New York and they would sit and watch the show together that night. And Mm -hmm. so uh, he said his wife was out of town or something. So uh, Johnny was going to make dinner for them and he had no idea what he made. So he made like um, uh chicken noodle soup or something and it was something he got in a package or a can and he put it in and he heated it up (laughs) puts it in a couple of bowls and they're sitting there and they're waiting for the show and and jack tastes it and he says you know this is the best chicken noodle soup i have ever had (laughs) uh you talk about freddie de cordova being the executive producer and peter lasalle being the a producer um from what I've read and what I've heard, LaSalle was really the hardworking guy, and Freddie de Cordova was the schmoozer. Like to have a cocktail on set. Uh, he did like to drink. Uh, yeah, he would drink uh, uh, on the side. He would have a, uh, and I never saw him, but I, I, you know, I know the prop guys would talk about it. He had a tumbler of, of vodka. He didn't drink during the day, but he would have a tumbler of vodka and he would sip it while the show went on. Uh, yeah, Fred was just, uh, you know, he was, he, he, he knew people and, uh, and he was the actually, which Peter never did. Uh, Fred was the uh, ax man. So if somebody was going to get fired, uh, if you got a call in the middle of the day to go to Fred's office, it was never good. One of the writers yeah. on the show who, you know, cause Johnny would fire and hire writers back. I mean, we had, when I was the head writer, Bob Smith, who was a genius, uh, it was his third time on the show. 
And we had another writer who was really, really funny named Tom Finnegan. And he said, <laughs> Finnegan got called down to Fred's office and fired one day. And he had like three or four kids and, you, you know, and he was never good with money and he was broke. And so he was really depressed. He said, and uh, he, you know, he just had, you know, Fred tell him to you know, pack his bags. So he goes to the mall with his family and he's afraid to tell them that he's been fired from the show. So he takes him to a movie and he takes him to King of Comedy with, with mm. De Niro. He said, he said he's sitting there being all depressed. And all of a sudden, a 20 foot Fred de Cordova shows up on the screen because he was in the movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Ted Wallison returns in a moment. Have you been tasked with the role of a state executor or expected maybe in the future you will be? Well, if so, let me make your life a lot simpler by introducing you to my friend Debbie Stanley. Debbie is the founder of ETP Canada. They specialize in estate administration. Their goal simply is to help Canadian executors understand their role and how to deal with the loved one's estate. Let's face it, there's no school for this. But ETP Canada offers services such as executor support, estate accounting, and they have a new online course called Executor Ready. It's an engaging video designed to make estate administration easier and affordable. And those are two comforting thoughts during a stressful time. So call Debbie Stanley at one 866 Three zero nine zero three eight seven. That's one eight six six three zero nine zero three eight seven. Or you can get her at info at etpcanada.ca. That's info at etpcanada.ca. I've had the great fortune to say that I've been associated with one of Toronto's finest names in men's clothing for more than twenty five years. Tom's Place. Founded by Tom Mahalik's father in 1958, Tom's Place offers brand name men's apparel at unbeatable prices. But more than that, they boast a long serving, knowledgeable, and friendly staff that can assist you whether you're looking for casual or formal attire. And they have plenty of first class tailors on site. In addition, Tom and his family are well known for their philanthropic work. So if you're looking to deal with great people who can fulfill your clothing desires at outstanding prices, do yourself a favor and visit Tom's Place. They're open weekdays from 11 to 6, Saturdays 10 to 5, and Sundays noon to 5. You'll find Tom's Place at 190 Baldwin in the heart of Kensington Market. Or check them out online at toms-place.com. Tom's Place will suit you. Now back to Ted Wallachin. You got to work with all these guest hosts, but you didn't write for all the guest hosts. I, I take it Leno came, came with his own set of writers. Yeah, so he Leno, he we wrote for Gary Shandling. Uh, you know, I don't remember them all, but uh, John Larroquette, Tony Danza, uh, Chevy Chase, Patrick Duffy we wrote for. Uh, the people we didn't write for, um, basically Billy Crystal had his own bit ready. Uh, Bill Cosby came and did two shows. And basically, he didn't use material. He came out and decided he was going to be charming and just ad libbed for uh, yeah. for ten minutes. And uh, then, yeah, it's as you say, just Jay had his audience. Yeah, <laughs> Jay had his own people. In fact, a friend of mine uh, for a million years uh, worked for him for oh uh, for thirty five years. Uh, and uh, yeah, so he would come in and because he'd like to go to a club the night before to test the material out. So, you know, mm-hmm. we could never write material for him the day before because, you know, we, you know, we were being paid by the show. So he would bring his own material in and he would be a fully prepared. And what about Letterman? Did you work with Letterman at all? No, no, we never worked with Letterman. Uh, Bob Smith. No, was it Bob or Tony? No, Tony DeSenter, who we work with, uh, actually ended up working for uh, for Letterman at one point. But uh, he would come on the show and he did a few things. But, you know, no, we never wor- worked for Letterman. If for people who saw, I think it was called uh, the the Late Shift, which chronicled the the battle between uh, uh, Leno and Letterman in getting Johnny's job and how everything sort of played out, and 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 it was kind of ugly. It was really ugly. And Leno had a a manager named Helen Kushnick, <laughs> who I, I've heard stories about Helen Kushnick that that made the hair on on my neck curl, and that's t- tough to do. She was a tough, tough woman. Yes. And I know that. Um, yeah, because when when basically the story broke that they were going to let Johnny go, which you know was was kind of bullshit. Uh, but, you know, 
Leno claimed he had no idea where the story came from, but everybody knew it was Helen. Helen was just yeah. seeding everything. And she actually got our office uh, when, uh, you know, Leno took over the show. And apparently uh, when they fired, she got fired, there was a gigantic party uh, for the staff. They, everybody was overjoyed that she was leaving the show, that she'd been shit canned. But uh, yeah, yeah. She, she did not. She was a very tough woman. And, and you yeah, know, she did not have many friends. And when Joan Rivers decided to leave, that had ended a, a, a long time friendship that she had with with, with Johnny, because Johnny thought that he it was dishonorable that she bailed on him. He was very loyal to her, and you know it, it was never easy, especially in the sixties, to be a woman comic. I mean, you take you you know, you would know because yeah. you, you you know there there were very few women comics. And, sure. you know, he brought her on the show and she was on the show a million times. And then he made her, you know, the permanent host. I mean, he was unbelievably loyal to her. He was he was Johnny was very loyal to people who he a had to be that you had to be talented, but B, mm-hmm. that, you know, he, that were loyal to you. He you know, it was it was a he felt you there should be some reciprocation. And I think he probably would have been fine with her going over to Fox if she had, you know, gone to him and said, you know, I've been offered this thing. I think it's a good opportunity. Uh, you know, uh, what do you think? You know, and I think Johnny probably would have said, go do it because he crushed everybody who'd gone and, and done uh, shows. He, you know, he, nobody had ever, mm-hmm. uh, but he, she just did it in such a classless way by just, you know, sucker punching him by never, you know, yeah. didn't he heard it through the press in this big, announcement that she's going to knock him off the air. And I I just think he was very hurt by it because I think he considered her to be a friend and she, she obviously wasn't, she was a very troubled woman. Was she well liked on the show? Uh, She was a very odd person. And I, I, you know, again, I, I know that uh, I don't think she was actually, there's a story in her book that uh, when she used to go on vacation, her father was like a doctor or something. And when they used to go on vacation, he used to make them uh, vacation in flop houses because he didn't want to spend any money. And I think this really must have done something to her because when she was on The Tonight Show you have, and she was guest hosting, you have a dressing room. And in the dressing room, you have, they give you a couple of, you know, uh, bolts of paper and a stapler and, uh, you know, stationery and, you know, drinks and all that kind of thing. And every day in the morning, she would call, it was all gone. And they would refill the dressing room. And if she was on for five days, they had to refill the dressing room every five days. And when she was in Vegas, you got a complimentary bar if you were headlined, right? You know, they'd have that little refrigerator. And Mm -hmm. she would empty the bar every night. And she had a a lockup in uh, Vegas. And she would put all this booze, you know, the mini bottles and the half bottles, she would put it all in this, uh, this locker. And once a year, she would send a couple of guys in a truck, pick up all this booze. She would drive it back to L.A., and she would steam the labels off and she would put her own personal labels on these liquor bottles and give them away as gifts. Wow. Yeah. What was his relationship with Ed McMahon like? Uh, Daryl Vickers, I'm speaking with, who was one of the head, the head writers along with, uh, with, his, with his colleagues. Colleague, I should say. Certainly, I've, I've made Andrew two people. Uh, <laughs> f- for he, has the ta- he has the talent of two people. Yeah, he's a, okay. Well, there you yeah. go. That's just for you, um, Andrew. They, they had a, you know, they had a, an interesting relationship. It was Edward. By the time we were on the show, you know, and the, the wild days were gone for Johnny and Ed. Um, Ed really was floating. I mean, you know, Johnny still took the show very, very seriously, but Ed had, you know, he was in a kind of a cruise control thing. So it was like, you know, he didn't want to use Ed for too much because you couldn't rely on him to, we did a thing called, um, oh God, uh, it was a mystic and I've lost his name now. Uh, so he would do this thing. And Ed had a big part in this, this particular thing. He would do questions and he would go into the audience and he would, there was a whole, and Ed loved to do it because it was a, it, he got to do some acting in this thing. And, mm-hmm. you know, he went into the audience and just 
okay, I'm going to watch my language. He goofed it up. <laughs> he got the pages mixed up. And basically, we're watching the show uh, backstage, and it goes to black. Uh, because And then and when we came back, Johnny was sitting at the desk. He just cut the bit short. And uh, Ed just was there. You, you couldn't trust him. So it was kind of like he was like uh, that kind of person, your, your pal who did, you know, that you, who's a bit of a goof, but you know, you bring him along because you've always brought him along. I think there was a tiny right. bit of that by the end of, you know, by the end of the run. Right. Uh, I recall seeing one episode of, of the Tonight Show because of course you can see them all. They're all available now where Ed is on sitting there next to Johnny and you can tell that he's had a couple of wobbly pops. And and Johnny looked at him and he's laughing and he says, "You you really think you're fooling them, don't you? You really think you're pulling yourself?" Yeah, that, that was yeah, that was before my time. Though uh, one day on his birthday, he went out with the boys, uh, and he came back, and he had a mm -hmm. he had a dressing room downstairs, but he had an office just around the corner from our office, mm -hmm. and uh, the door was open, and he, when he got back from lunch. Uh, he was there all afternoon laying on the couch trying to sober up for the show. And we all were all the writers were placing bets on whether he would actually be able to pull himself together or not to be able to make the show that night. Yeah, <laughs> I, I heard an interview with Peter LaSalle once and he said to this day, he says he can't comprehend in his own mind how somebody like Johnny Carson, who, who could get up and entertain millions of people and was so open and gregarious and yet would go to a party at somebody's house and sit in a corner by himself because he was so shy. Was he really that shy, or that introverted, or did he not care about people? I, I think he was, he was very uncomfortable making small talk, you know, like on the phone. Like he called, he got the answers, he was off that phone. When we went to uh, for the job interview uh, and he didn't know us, he had a little affectation. He would wink. He would wink at you. And when he knew you, he didn't wink at you. He was a nervous tick. He had. Right, right, right. So he was, you know, again, here was this legend meeting two idiots from Canada <laughs> and, and their manager. And, you know, he, he was winking because he was uncomfortable in that moment. Right. So I can, you know, I can believe that uh, there, there's a there's a there are any number of performers that are completely different people. You know, it's like some sports figures who are on the ice, they're the, the most miserable sons of bitches. You know, they're elbowing you and they're cheating and they're right, sticking right. with their stick. And when they're off their ice, they're the nicest guy in the world. It's just like there's this split personality. And, and there are some performers like that that are, you know, are very... And why you would have that if you were a, a an introvert, why you would have that compulsion to get on stage. And, and Johnny mm. did start out as a writer. You know, he did comedy and things, but he, he wrote for, I think, Benny and he wrote for any number of shows before he actually uh, became a, a full time entertainer. Well, and David Letterman is the same type of personality as well. Antisocial, hated show business, just yes, didn't yeah. want to do anything uh, to do with the big parties and anything. I would say, you know, just knowing the stories I've heard, because I, I don't know Letterman, but he was even more, I think, uh, shy and and troubled in his private life than Johnny. Yeah, he, he was, he was uh, from the stories I heard, he was a very odd duck. I forgot to ask you this, Daryl. How old were you and Andrew when you first got your job as writers on The Tonight Show? Um, uh, we were, let me think, uh, it was, uh, we were 29, 28, 29, somewhere wow. in there. Yeah. That's, that's, that's pretty, yeah. Uh, pretty heavy duty stuff for 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 a young man when when you're talking about literally dealing with an icon the the, the show that nobody could knock off the air well interesting years before that uh speaking of legends i mean we got a um we got a call one day uh from uh, george carlin mm -hmm. uh and we known his brother but uh, apparently his brother had given George a script we'd written and we got a call from, and George was on a plane somewhere going to a show. And he said, listen, I'm doing this HBO special and it's a, it's going to be a sitcom and I'm having trouble putting it together. And I wondered if you guys would come in and help me with it. And this was before Johnny, we'd only been in LA like a year. And you said, yeah. And the next thing we knew we're sitting in a room 
with George Carlin telling him how to put his half hour show together wow. and pitching jokes. And, and there's just us and George. And I, I tell the story often that I don't understand how we were not catatonic with shock. <laughs> yeah, it's that a little That we were daunting. sitting in a room with one of the biggest legends in comedy. I mean, I, I can remember, you know, because he was, he, he, you know, all those AMFM and all those albums, he was like the God and talk yeah. about a brilliant man. Yeah. And funny. And we were, we were 27, I think at the time. Wow. And we're sitting in a room with George Carlin telling him, no, no, I think we put that bit over here, George, and then start with this thing. And okay, fellas, let's do that. Uh, yeah. Uh, it was, and, after the, and before that, we were writing for. Um, I got a call one day. We're sitting in the unemployed in uh, in in Burbank, and I get a call on my phone, and it's uh, somebody I vaguely knew, and she said, "Listen, Mickey Rooney's head writer just died, and he's looking for somebody new. He's going to be calling you in twenty minutes." So, so I pick up the phone, and Mickey Rooney's on the phone, and we were Mickey's writers for I think about almost ten years. We we do all his you know he would do sugar babies and we do all his uh, uh, his stuff for when he was in uh, say Philadelphia it was mm -hmm. cheese sticks it was the Eagles it was the Liberty Bell and he would call me at the mid in the middle of the night and give a, tell okay this is what I need fellas and then we'd write it and send it off to him I mean in in Mickey Rooney's prime correct me if I'm wrong here Daryl was he not one of the highest paid entertainers of his time. Oh, I think he was the absolutely for any number of years. I think back, I think if you went into the late thirties, early forties, I think he, for like six or seven years, he was the number one entertainer in the world. Uh, it's funny because by the time we worked for him, he was only in his early sixties, but because he'd been a, a celebrity since he was like three, people thought he was 90. <laughs> and yet he ended up, he had, he had a, a, a pension for, uh, for horses. Which I, which I guess I think he had a pension for a lot of things. You know, he had a yeah. drinking problem back in the sixties, and uh, he yeah, he was all and he would spend money. You know, he was uh, he would call us up, and there would there would be this dance. We had a lawyer, and so literally, where Mickey was always on tour somewhere, and he would call me up and wake me up in the middle of the night and tell me a movie he wanted us to write or a stage play or this or that. And I'd take down all the particulars and then we would have to get our manager to call his lawyer to see if they were actually going to pay for it or whether the lawyer could talk Mickey out of doing the project and saving him some money. Yeah. So, you know, so I never knew whether there was a gig there or not. Half the time we worked for him, half the time his lawyer managed to talk him out of the, whatever it was. I don't think it's uh, it comes to as much of a, uh, as much of a surprise to people that Carson wanted Letterman to take over for him. He didn't want Jay Leto. He didn't really like he Jay felt, Leto. Yeah. No, he felt, I think he liked Jay. I mean, Jay's a nice guy, but you know, again, Johnny uh, had a, a, a very strong feeling of what, you know, right, wrong was. And he felt that Letterman had done his time, had been a very loyal guy, had done the 1230 slot, uh, you know, and then should be moved up because, you know, he'd, he'd proven that he could do it. Whereas Jay had been, you know, a nice guest host, but he had not, you know, I mean, how many, I think Letterman had done it for what, 10, 12 years by then. Something so like he that. just felt it was, it was a natural thing for Jay to take that, uh, for Letterman to take the spot. And Jay should have probably taken Letterman's spot and waited his own turn. Yeah. He would, that would have been the natural progression. And it, to me, whatever it's worth. I think that Letterman was, was the better of the two at the end of the day, when you look back in, in terms of being a combination of an interviewer and a performer, I think he had those qualities sewn up. Letterman did. Yeah, I know there was, there was a certain, I think probably what NBC was looking at was there was more of an every man element to Jay's material mm -hmm. where you know, Letterman could get into odd things and sometimes some cruel things, you know, he would, and he would, he was a little smarter and a little more serving. I mean, even the Johnny, the, some of the stuff Letterman did was a little more cutting edge and they may have felt that that cutting edge stuff was probably better suited to 1230 and, and Jay would come in as, you know, just Mr. Everyman and, you know, like Johnny was Mr. Everyman, but obviously a different kind of, uh, a different kind of performer. So I think that, that that was probably part of their calculation that Jay would come in and just 
just tell jokes and not be too acerbic. And it's interesting how Letterman uh, and probably every talk show host who follow Johnny Carson all said essentially the same thing, that if, if not for Johnny, they wouldn't be here. And Letterman used to say, you know, we're all just pretending to be Johnny Carson. It's it's amazingly hard to, you know, it looks relatively easy, but to sit there and have that naturalness that he had, that mm-hmm. ease with, you know, you know, when he would come out and do the monologue, there was just an ease about Johnny. And, well, you know how hard it is to do to do jokes and how to, to yeah. work with an audience. And, you know, he he only saw those jokes at two thirty that day. Mm-hmm. That was the first time he saw them. He picked them out. He would have to, you know, and he'd have them on the cue cards and he would come out through that that uh, curtain and then he would read those cards and tell those jokes to that audience like uh, like he'd rehearsed them 12 times. You know, it was just I only was on the show once we were there was a sketch where we'd written the thing where we had uh, pizza boys and they came out and he knocked the pizza boys over and they were <laughs> dominoes. So they were dominoes pizza and it was a little silly pun, but we needed four people to come out and push them over. And I think I was fourth or third or fourth in this line. And he would push the first guy and then we'd all fall through the curtain. And I can remember being backstage waiting for the queue and then walking along like Johnny did every night, the curtains would open and we walked out into that light and there was the audience staring above us. And we only had to hit a mark and I had no lines. And I felt that pressure. And I thought, you know, I get it. It was a new sense of, this is really, really hard. Yeah. I can imagine to, to just that whole thing of the curtain opening and walking out and the lights. And it was, yeah, it was an eye opener for me. And all I had to do was stand there and fall over. And you're right, because as, as a stand up comedian, you're, you're touring the country and you're doing the same material every night. You know this stuff inside out back. You could, you could do your act backwards, but you're going out every night with a new set of jokes that you've never really performed in front of anyone. And you're thinking, I don't know if this is going to work or not. Then there was all this uh, talk where people were saying, Oh, the writers used to write purposely would write bad jokes so that Johnny could do his little uh, his little tap dance and T for two would play and and no, I don't I no, never we didn't believed because it was <laughs> I no, never believed it was a that certain, you would. <laughs> yeah, there's a certain thing called being fired, and yeah. that really prevented <laughs> us from deciding to uh, to do any uh, you know again. He read them at 2.30. Yeah. Well, you know how hard it is to read audiences and jokes, and you go out and you think a joke is great, and you know. Sometimes the joke is great and it will flop. And sometimes you'll go out and you'll pick the wrong joke and the, or the, you'll misjudge the mood of the room or something. And he was he, he had two hours to put everything together before he went out and did those jokes right in front of an audience. And yeah, it's it was it's a very, very tough thing. And the difference between Jay and Johnny was Johnny would flow with those when the joke bombed, he flowed with it. Jay would tell the next joke. He couldn't do that. He didn't have that ease that Johnny had with, okay, you know, I picked it. It's, you know, and Johnny never blamed you if a joke bombed or a spot bombed. If he picked it, he believed in it. And, you know, if the audience didn't laugh, he, you know, he he took it on the chin and it it was his responsibility. If he picked it, he, you know, he didn't blame you if if it tanked. And boy, you know, again, you're doing it three, four times a week for, you know, we did 700 shows, you know, some of the some of the time you're gonna bomb. Did you ever go out as a writer? Was that ever your responsibility to go out and read the audience before a show to get an idea of what maybe you should pull out of the monologue? We didn't have anything to do. Johnny picked them. We wrote the monologue, but Johnny would pick the jokes. Right. That that was his. We would put together the sketches. But there was a trick I had, where so what happened was Ed would come out and do a um, he would do a a little warm up for the show. And it was word for word every single night. He did not change a syllable. And I used to go down and I used to listen to Ed. And if the audience was very quiet, I knew it was going to be a rough night. And if the audience was, you know, relatively responsive, I I thought it was going to be a good night. And if the audience was like just hooting and hollering, it was going to be a disastrous night. Because when you're doing a sketch... Mm -hmm. You know, when those despots, what you're doing is you're giving them a premise that they have to listen to. And then you're doing jokes off that premise. Yeah. Well, if they're wild 
and they're hooting and hollering, they're looking around and having a great time. They don't have the attention span to listen to what the setup is. So I could gauge generally how good the, the spot was going to be that night. Because, yeah, if they were wild, I, I knew we were going to we, we were in trouble. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned that there's there's really several facets of being a talk show host in, in that vein. It, you, you've got to be able to deliver the jokes. You've got to be able to do the, the sketches. And then you've got to be a good interviewer as well. And sometimes I, I, there must have been times when Johnny would be sitting there with a guest that he had couldn't give a damn about and thinking like, <laughs> how the hell do I get out of this thing? I got to kill six minutes. Oh yeah, well Bob was Sir Bob Hope was certainly one of the times well, yeah, where yeah. you know he he was just going through the motions because you couldn't do anything other than go through the motions. What uh, when we had civilians on, which uh, you know those are the world's oldest skydiver, or uh, there was a woman who ate nothing but raw uh, vegetables and had no electricity, and we would bring on all these you know oddballs. You couldn't trust them to be entertaining. You know, it was it was probably they were going to do something because, you know, we, we but when you got them on the air, you never knew. So those were the only times that we would write jokes on his cards mm -hmm. for because you knew everything was choreographed on the show. So he knew every question and he knew every answer. They were on the cards, whether it was a whether it was a um, a celebrity or a uh, or a civilian. And but for the civilians, we would get the cards and we would write jokes for the question. We would write jokes for the answer just to, in case something, you know, was getting a little slow, he'd be able to pot, toss in a uh, to tent pole, as we used to call it, tent pole the interview. Yeah, cool stuff. Uh, this, this has been a quite, quite a fascinating, uh, well, almost an hour, I guess, now chatting with you, Daryl, and, and I could talk for hours and hours about, uh, about the Tonight Show because I grew up watching Tonight Show, as did so many of us. And and I could talk hours and hours about some of some of the other projects that you were involved in. I got two sheets worth of shows that I'm thinking, <laughs> well, I'm going to have to focus in on one thing here. Otherwise, this is going to turn into a, a six week show. Uh, but I thank you so much for this. The, the insights are great. Um, brings back a lot of terrific memories and congratulations to you and your great successes. What's what's up for you now in the future? Uh, I just got a call uh, literally last night. A show that I, you know, that I'd been helping develop uh, was dead, and uh, I hadn't heard anything, um, and in, in like eight months. And I got a call last night about nine o'clock at night from LA saying, "I think I think that may have sold." So, uh, so this I can't get into it, but it's kind of a reality comedy kind of thing, and I've got another project that I'm working on uh, with some people, a uh, co-production between Canada and India. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I only do what I, you know, things that interest me now. Uh, I've moved back to Toronto and I'm semi-retired. So if something project comes along that's interesting, I'll, I'll jump into it. But uh, yeah, the days of having to do crap are hopefully over for me. Yeah. And I guess um, uh, Nobby Clegg has been retired to the, uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> though you know, every once in a while, it will, it will. David uh, Marsden will uh, charitably play our songs on on his wonderful uh, radio show. David Marsden being uh, the man who uh, really turned CFNY into the iconic oh. radio station that it was. Oh, um, I, I, so much of the music I listened to was uh, started yeah. by that channel and David. Yeah. Yes, great stuff, Daryl. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. All the best to you. Well, thank you for having me. So once again, thanks for being with us. If it's your first time here, we appreciate it and hope you come back and hope you recommend our podcast to, to your friends. And don't forget, follow us. Also, don't forget, if you get a chance, go online, fill out your organ and tissue donation card. You could change or even save a life. Have a great week. The Ted Wallace and Podcast has been brought to you by Helenda's The Meat People. Enjoy their award-winning products at selected Metro, Sobeys, Fortino's, and Foodland locations. Helenda's, the way sausage should taste. And Tom's Place, for the finest in men's clothing at unbeatable prices, it's Tom's Place at 190 Baldwin in the heart of Kensington Market. Tom's Place will suit you. The Ted Wallachian Podcast is produced by Joey Roselli. Technical production by Paul Gatt. Music by Bike Thieves. I'm Becky Coles. Submit your questions and comments to ted at twmedia.ca.